your source for everything paranormal. Para X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Merry meet and merry parts, bright the cheeks and warm the heart. For tread the circle thrice about to keep unwelcome spirits out. Bide within the law you must, in perfect love and perfect trust. Mind the threefold laws you should, three times bad and three times good. These eight words the read fulfill, and ye harm none to what ye will. Welcome to Stirring the Cauldron on the Para-X Radio Network. And now, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Merry meet everybody and welcome to the show. I mean, take a seat around the cauldron and get comfy, but don't get too close because I'm brewing a fresh batch of spider cider and it splatters a little. So just, you know, keep your distance. All right, so tonight my guest is Nick Redfern and we're going to be talking about his book, Diary of Secrets, UFO Conspiracies and the Mysterious Death of Marilyn Monroe. Nick is the author of more than 60 books on UFOs, The Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, Zombies, and Hollywood Scandal. His books include The Roswell UFO Conspiracy, Women in Black, Men in Black, Nessie, Chupacabra, Road Trip, a whole lot more. Uh, He's a regular on the Travel Travel Channel show In Search of Monsters. He's also appeared on BBC's Out of This World Sci-Fi Channel's Proof Positive, and the National Geographic Channel's Paranatural. Now, if you're listening live, um, pop over to the paraxradionetwork.com and join us in the chat room where you can interact with the guests, you can ask them questions, and you can share comments. And if you're listening to the podcast, keep in mind that you're always welcome in chat during the live show on Thursdays. All right, Nick, you can remove the virtual duct tape I slapped on your you on your mouth a couple of minutes ago, and welcome back. Hey, Marla. How's it going? <laughs> it's going good. <laughs> good. This, um, I, and I, I told you this before, but I'm going to tell everybody, too. I couldn't put this book down. Um, it was so fascinating. I, I, at first, I'm like, well, what does Marilyn Monroe have to do with UFOs? You know, But right away, it jumped out. And then it just kept getting better and better and better. So... Um, You've been researching this subject for about 25 years off and on, and you're pretty sure it's not done with yet. So so what is it about this story that is seemingly never-ending? Yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't um, want people to think I've done nothing for 25 years to just investigate this <laughs> one case, you know. <laughs> but, um, but across roughly 25 years, thereabouts, um, I've started uh, being involved in investigating it. Now, um, you're quite right, you know, when you said that um, people have sort of, a, you know, an absolute right to say what on earth has Marilyn Monroe got to do um, with UFOs? And more importantly, what has her death got to do with UFOs? Now, um, if you've looked in, ever into the, the life and death of Marilyn um Monroe, you'll find out that her death was on August the 4th, 1962. And over the years, there have been a lot of rumors about her death. Um, Was it suicide? Was it um, uh, accident? Was it murder? Was it a call, a cry for help? That kind of thing. Um, But if you look deep into the story, it does sound very much as if um, it was either a case of outright murder or she was, um, if you like, pushed into a state of depression and anxiety and stress um, to the point where she killed herself. But but in that sense, it would have been sort of a um, a driven suicide, so to speak. Um, and one of the reasons, the primary reasons why there have been a lot of rumours about her death is because in the, the first part of 1962 onward, 
Marilyn was having affairs with both JFK, uh, President John F. Kennedy, and also Robert Kennedy, um, at the at the time the Attorney General of the U.S. government, and of course. For that reason, you know, she became, uh, by default almost, she became like a national security threat um, because we know, thanks to her diary that she put together that uh, over the years, she, um, every time, you know, she heard some new bit of tidbit information, etc., um, she put it in this uh, diary and the, the Kennedy brothers did not know this. Um, but when this came out, within government at least, that Marilyn had been sort of scrupulously, you know, copying all this down, well, then the, you know, things like the red alarm went off, you know, and, um, and something had to be done, essentially. And that's where we get to the point of her mysterious death. And, uh, and that's how it gets to the UFO angle, because of her being told of some of these government secrets, one of them uh, being about UFOs and crashed UFOs and dead, strange dead bodies in um, held at military bases and things like that. Um, and, and again, as I said, you know, put all that together and then you've got the, the kind of this um, mysterious national security issue which rolls over into Hollywood and uh, and Marilyn Monroe. Yeah, you would think, I mean, okay, so she's probably was thinking, you know, wow, both Kennedys, they want me, they like me, whatever. And she was, I, would, I read that she had problems with her self-esteem, you know. Yeah. So it was a great thing for her to say, well, I've got both of them. And then when she had all this juicy gossip, or not gossip, I mean, she was, you know, pillow talk can be dangerous. And um, maybe she was trying to impress, you know, people that, that whatever, the same reason that they were trying to impress her with that kind of information. Um, cause I think, I think you said in the book, apparently Bobby Kennedy shared way too much, you know, about Fidel Castro and about the Soviets and the connection with the CIA. But I want to jump up, uh, back one little tick because, um, I was really surprised when you were talking about um, a certain document that the CIA created that is now in public domain called A Study of Assassination. Why don't you explain what that is? Because kind of, that's a piece of the puzzle, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, this is where it gets important because in one respect we have a fascinating real document that has been declassified under the terms of the Freedom of Information Act and it's called a study of assassination and it's an almost unique document because it's an official CIA document telling um, CIA agents how to kill people and make it look like an accident. I mean it's almost like a unique document you know uh, telling people this is how we want you to kill them you know but we we don't want um, anyone to know that um, you know that this is a that this is what we're doing um but if you if you google a study excuse me a study of assassination cia um you'll be able to find the document and uh, and download it and um and it's not you know just a copy paste or anything like that it's a it's a pdf um of the original uh, original document now what's intriguing is that one of the ways in which the CIA in that document, um, and as I said, it's important to note that uh, it, it did come from the Freedom Information Act. You know, it, it's not sort of, um, you know, a questionable document or something like that at all. Um, but um, Marilyn, when she died at the time of her death, um, you know, she was heavily on um, alcohol and drugs and she had a, a nurse and a doctor. Now, believe it or not, the um, the document, the study of assassination um, document, talks about one of the best ways to kill someone and make it look like a suicide or an accident would be um, to have the person involved or the targeted person um, filled up with alcohol and drugs 
and have a nurse and a doctor uh, on the exact same site as well to make sure that the overdose worked unless they needed, you know, another shot and another shot. And when you read that, it literally 100% mirrors the the terminology of what happened in relation to um, Marilyn's death. And, um, and that's really one of the most memorable documents because it's hard, if not impossible, to uh, sort of say to yourself, well, this is just coincidence. It, it clearly is not. And the, the chances are that that document, the study of assassination, almost certainly... Um, you know, the the goals and the way to do it and um, almost certainly came from that document. And then when Marilyn died, you know, you could make almost like a 99.% sure situation or scenario that, um, that that's what took her down, essentially, this document. Yeah, and I'm a little bit later going to get to something that, somebody else did the same thing during all of this because there's so many people involved um, in this whole case. I mean, it just keeps going and going and going. Um, But um, somebody just sent me a question on Facebook. Um, With all those documents out there that anyone can look up, like this one, how is it that some people can easily get away with murder? I mean, that's kind of what they're teaching them how to do. I mean, how legal is that, you know? Well, actually, yeah, that is a good point. I mean, um, the the document itself, a study of assassination, as I said, an official, real CIA document, um, it was designed essentially to take out um, enemies to the United States. You know, it wasn't trying to, you know, find the guy, you know, at the local liquor store. We don't like him or something. <laughs> you know, we want him gone. It was not like that, you know. The, mm-hmm. the people who were targeted um, were people who were perceived as threats to U.S. Na- national security. Mm-hmm. So in one sense, it wasn't perceived as murder. From their perspective, it was the perception was, well, we're doing this um, to save, you know, U.S. national security. That was the approach. And, of course... Um, you know, up until um, the early 1960s, Marilyn obviously was not any kind of um, national security threat. Mm -hmm. But, as we said sort of earlier on, you know, when you're sort of, you know, you're having affairs with both um, Kennedy brothers and, um, and they're sharing information with her in a way really to impress her into the bedroom, so to speak. Now, what's very important is that Marilyn's diary, you know, it was not like the typical sort of little diary kind of, it was nothing like, you know, dear diary, I went to the park today and fed the dogs and cats. <laughs> you know, it was not like that. Um, a lot of people think Marilyn was just like this ditzy, crazy blonde. She was not. She kind of worked on that scenario, that angle, but she was not. Uh, I'll give you an example. In 1955, she actually um, applied for a visa to travel to the Soviet Union, uh, to Russia, um, because she'd heard, you know, what Russia was like, but she wanted to see it for herself. And, um, and J. Edgar Hoover was sort of really um, angry about this, and he put... Um, he put wiretaps on her home and had agents, <coughs> excuse me, had agents follow her. Um, and she, it was in 1955 because of this that when she became to a degree sort of a start of becoming a national security issue. And the, we don't know the full length of the surveillance file on Marilyn by the FBI. Um, the FBI have a website called The Vault, and there's about 200 pages there which you can download, um, which have been declassified. But there are rumors that a file at one, a file at one point was around about 2,000 pages, but it was shredded, supposedly, when Hoover uh, died in 1972. So we may never get you know, some of the other original files. But um, that's when Marilyn became 
to a degree, you know, someone who affected national security. Then, when she got mixed up with the Kennedys, and, you know, the both of them had sort of told her things about plans to invade Cuba, uh, to have to you have the mafia get involved with the CIA and do, you know, if there was any sort of really you know, dangerous operations and the CIA needed them done but didn't want to do themselves, you know, they might get the mafia in, that kind of thing. And there was also, uh, um, Marilyn was also told of plans to uh, assassinate Fidel Castro of um, of Cuba. Um, so you can easily see how Marilyn went from being, from being, you know, the world's most famous actress um to a, a definitive national security threat to the United States, as bizarre as it sounds. And, and the, the key thing in all of this is that one of the secrets that Marilyn was told of by the Kennedys was that at some point back in the 1940s, um, the U.S. government had got its hands on this crashed, strange craft and these small mangled bodies out in the New Mexico desert and nobody knew what they were, where they came from, uh, what they were and the government basically, you know, freaked out to the extent that, you know, as much as possible was clamped down. And we're talking probably, we're not for sure, if, uh, but probably talking about the Roswell case, you know, mm-hmm. with the, the crash the bodies, etc., etc. Mm-hmm. Um, now you put all them together, and then the person who's got all that information, and who may be, you know, a dangerous figure. Well, that person could be in in real trouble. And it was roughly round about four months. She um, was told all of this. Um, we're talking about maybe March, February, March, April of August. Um, excuse me, um, April, May of 1962. That um, she started to really fill out this diary, and it was August 1964 um, when she was found dead. So the timing, you know, was really a case of well, you know, it's all coming out and we cannot let it get out and someone's got to do something and it's got to look innocent or tragic, but it cannot look like a murder, assassination or anything like that. We just need to lock this down and if we have to do it in the worst way possible, well, that's what we've got to do. Do you think the... um the nurse that was there and the doctor were um, from the CIA or did the C or they were maybe her people beforehand, but the CIA got a hold of them and twisted their arm. Do you think there was some kind of coercion like that? Well, um, well, it's difficult to say now. Um, what we do know for sure is, I mean, they, they weren't CIA doctors. Um, they were doctors um, that would, basically hired, you know, because Marilyn, unfortunately, you know, she was slightly unstable at times. Yeah. And so she did have a psychiatrist and she did have a doctor um, and a nurse at times. Um, and so for that reason, you know, they, they were hired. Now, as far as we know, you know there are rumors um, about when Marilyn's body was found that um, in the rooms, you know, where she won one of the rooms where she died in other rooms the same night. Um, The the nurse and the doctor actually sort of um, moved around some of the things in her bedroom and in some of the other rooms. And there's never been sort of a real um, clear um, reason as to why that was done. And, um, And there were some discrepancies in the stories leading up to her death on the early morning of of 62, uh, August 62. And um, and there was a lot of really weird sort of uh, information that, that didn't fit together. And so in that sense, you know, we do know that, um, um, you know, from the late um, August 62 through August, um, uh, 
excuse me, August uh, the sex. Let's get it right. Yeah, on the second of August, nineteen sixty-two, through the third, through the fourth, when she died or was killed. Um, that's when we know there was a lot of weird stuff going on in that period, a lot of discrepancies. And, um, and what also happened was that when her body was taken to the morgue, um, some of her um, possessions were taken as well. One of them was actually the diary. And several of the um, staff who were working there at that time when she was brought in um, said that um, they'd seen this thick diary uh, along with another of her um, various other uh, things of hers. Um, but after about three days, um, a small group of men came in and the diary was taken away. Now, that diary has never been seen again. Over the years, people have come forward either claiming, number one, that they had it, or number two, they could get it and they, you know, for a high price, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um but none of these um, claims and stories have ever sort of, um, you know, come to fruition. And so for that reason, you know, we, we don't know. My personal view is I don't think they probably would have destroyed the diary or burned it or trashed it, mainly because, you know, if there were a lot of uh, really significant uh, data within that diary, and over the years, you know, it needed to, if there was like another leak in the security issue in like the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and, you know, maybe something um, got lost, you know, over the years, they may well have to go back and look at that diary, you know, and see if they needed any other issues contained in that diary, you know, that had been held away for years. So I think they probably would have kept it and... and the chances are one day, you know, or I should say there's a possibility, I guess, under those circumstances, the diary could surface, but so far at uh, least it hasn't, mm-hmm. you know. So so that's sort of the official part of the story that we know so far. Yeah, I thought it was weird that, that I was going to bring that up before you did um, about the diary showing up at the morgue. At, yeah, at the morgue, because that was just kind of strange to me. Um, and maybe I read this wrong, but I think I, I'm not. I got the impression that it was so much more than just Fidel Castro and the Soviets and the connection to the CIA and the mob. To me, as I was reading it, I had the feeling that. The UFO thing was very, very strong then, and that was maybe like what broke the camel's back. Well, yeah, well, this is where it gets controversial because although between 1962 onward, you know, the, over the years, the, uh, numerous books were written about her death, well, and her life and her death, um, and that angle of Marilyn's death period, um, that has not gone away, and up until mostly that time, you know, people were talking again about, you know, she was killed because of what she knew about Cuba and the mafia and that kind of thing. However, um, in 1995, a very controversial document surfaced, and it basically what it was, um, it was a wiretap, it, or I should say, it was the. Um, the, um, the the text of a um, of a wiretap between two different people. One was a man named um, Howard Rothberg, who was a friend of Marilyn Monroe. He was um, he was a house designer, and the other person was a man, uh, excuse me, a woman named Dorothy Kilgallen. And mm-hmm. Dorothy Kilgallen was a, a well respected journalist in the U.S. in the um, 1950s and the 1960s and the sort of the um the story behind this is because the the cia was very concerned about marilyn you know blowing the whistle on all of this they kept wiretaps as they were known way back then you know like um um, you know, today, you know, it's just like sort of, you know, just listening on people's phone calls. But back then they called it wiretaps. Mm-hmm. And um, 
And the reason why they listened to Dorothy Kilgallen, one was because she was friends with uh, Marilyn Monroe, but also Dorothy Kilgallen back in the 50s got hold of a... Um, a story from British intelligence when she was on vacation in the summer of 1955 and she got a story from British intelligence about a crashed UFO and these dead little bodies etc and um, so the CIA put all this together and um, and the document um, talks about how Marilyn needed to be basically shut up and it, the document is dated um, one day before her death, which is kind of very telling. Now, a lot of people have said, well, how do we know this document is real? You know, isn't it just a bit too wild? You know, the idea of um, sort of, you know, combining UFOs with Marilyn Monroe and the Kennedys, you know, it kind of sounds like the ultimate X-Files episode, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, however, um, and this, the, this document did not surface until 1995, and that's when it started, when it started to come out, and then a number of people in the UFO field started to look at this document and also bring in forensics people. And what we know for sure is that the heading on the document, um, does fit the, um, the actual, um, so the, the heading, if you like, of the the, uh, the CIA and the emblems, that kind of thing. We also know that the typewriter and the typeface and the type font um, were from the 1950s. So if somebody, um, you know, um, if somebody was just going to go ahead and quickly, you know, type something out and... Um, and pretend, you know, it's a real document, they, they would have gone much further than that. Uh, as I said, you know, somebody had gone to the, uh, the extent of getting a 1950s typewriter, the font, everything that the CIA used. And, um, and there's two copies. One of these copies vanished in the 50s, and I've got the, the first copy of the original and even the copy the one i've got it's sort of yellowed and flaking and um and it's clearly you know not um any kind of something put together you know in uh, like the 1992 or something like that mm -hmm. and so i began looking into this story of dorothy kilgallen and howard rothberg and how they played in with marilyn and how this document talked, how the CIA were wiretapping the homes of all of them, and how also, you know, the CIA was talking about, you know, this is just going too far. We need to just lock it all down, and by lock it down, that's they meant it forever, you know. So, you know, that's, that's when I was, this was sort of 95, nine, something like that. I mean, I was only in my 20s then, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I thought, well, this will be an interesting case to look into. And um, and that's what I did. And so over the years then, since then, so the end of the 90s to now, um, so 25 years later thereabouts or whatever, um, you know, I've sort of followed it with every other lead and uh, snippet and that's come to me or that I've gone looking for. And in that period since, you know, um, I was sort of very surprised but also intrigued that more and more um, material that's added to the story um, it sort of resonated with all the previous material which which mm -hmm. was a good thing as well so. yeah well we're going to take a quick break um, so everybody go hide your diaries and knowing some of you you'd probably end up on the six o'clock news if anybody found them and uh, you got two two short minutes to do it so get moving don't go away there's more stirring the cauldron with Marla Brooks right after these important messages hey everyone it's Marla if you like tonight's episode of Stirring the Cauldron and the Archive Podcast as well, take a look at the show's YouTube channel and check out the dozens of shows that are there just waiting to be heard. New shows are added each week, and while you're there, why not subscribe? It's free. 
And if you click on that tiny little bell icon at the top of the page, you'll be notified when new shows are available. Just go to youtube.com and then type in Stirring the Cauldron Pair X and the link will appear. Just like magic. Juarez with Cat Paranormal of Minnesota. Hi, I'm Willow Layman Shunt, Psychic Medium, Dark Nola Paranormal, New Orleans. And I'm Jerry Ayers with Supernatural Investigators of Minnesota. And together, we are The Calling. Every Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time and 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, only on ParaXRadioNetwork.com. Welcome back to Stirring the Cauldron. Once again, here's your host, Marla Brooks. My guest this week is Nick Redfern, and we're delving into his book, Diary of Secrets, UFO Conspiracies, and the Mysterious Death of Marilyn Monroe. And I've got a question in the chat room, but I just want to add something about Dorothy Kilgallen, because I think, you know, if people are over 40 or 50 right now, they kind of might remember that she was also a panelist on one of the most popular TV shows back in 1950 to 65 until she died, What's My Line? And I remember going on YouTube and kind of looking at some of those old shows, and the show um, right after she passed away, um, the host, John Daly, did the opening of the show and he explained that she had passed and gave a brief tribute. Um, he looked shell shocked. The whole panel looked shell shocked. Um, and they never mentioned how she passed. And that came like, you know, as a big blow to the country, um, who probably had no idea of what was going on or what led up to her unexpected demise. But here is the clincher. As with Marilyn Monroe, her death was determined to have been caused by a fatal combination of alcohol and barbiturates. Sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> well, yeah, you're right. I mean, her, the <clears throat> the circumstances of um, Dorothy's um, death and Marilyn's actually extremely similar. <clears throat> the deaths were reportedly alcohol and pills. Um, now, what's important first to know, although... Um, Dorothy, um, you know, was a, a major figure on what's my na- uh, my line. Um, she was also um, a very adept um, investigative journalist, yes. and um, I managed to get her FBI file um, th- through the FBI through the terms of the um, Freedom of Information Act, and that file ran to about 250 pages, and it made it very clear that both the FBI and the CIA were watching all of her activities. Mm -hmm. And um, she was found dead one night in 1965 in one of her bedrooms. I say one of her bedrooms was because she had her very own bedroom, obviously. However, um, there was also a spare room, and she was found on that night in the spare room, which obviously she never used. So the theory is... If she was assassinated and the person who assassinated her didn't realize he'd got the wrong room. Mm. Um, now, also, bear in mind that Marilyn, you know, had affairs with both of the Kennedy brothers. Mm-hmm. Um, Marilyn died right at the time when um, she was deep into the looking into the Kennedy assassin assassination, uh, John F. Kennedy yeah. in uh, Dallas, please. He, um, uh, Daily Plaza in Dallas um, in November 1963. And so, again, we've got like another tie-in with the Kennedys, and then somebody else dies, in this case, Dorothy Kilgallen. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, we've got things like that. And then, of course, you know, in 1968, uh, we've got Robert Kennedy killed, and, you know, just about everybody... Um, in the you know the inner circle of all these people ended up dead and and suspiciously so um in various ways um 
So, you know, you've got this really sort of bizarre and sinister situation. And and as I said, um, in, back in 1955, Dorothy was given this story by British intelligence who were working with the US um, in relation again to try and figure out what these strange bodies and this sort of um, destroyed, you know, craft that had been slammed into the desert floor and try to figure out what they were, where they were from. And apparently the biggest concern for both U.S. intelligence and British intelligence was they just simply did not know what these things were, where they came from, what their agenda was, um, where they came from, or anything. And and also that there was a high degree of panic, you know, just seeing these things out of the blue, you know. So, um, and they essentially came up with a quick answer. Well, why don't we just hide it all away? You know, kind of like, uh, because they couldn't understand the technology. So, you know, if you ever watch the um, the movie Raiders of the uh, Lost Ark, you know, at the very end where there's this huge warehouse with all these crates stored away, that's kind of the scenario that um, Dorothy Kilgallen picked up, that the government mm-hmm. did not know what to do. They were panicked on both sides of the Atlantic. And, um, and so the, the answer was, well the best thing to do is just hide it and then no one will ever know until we can figure out the technology. So that that was kind of how that part of the story took off. And then the next one, for me at least, was then to start look for corroborative material that would add to the, the official story that we know uh, and alongside with the, the leaked document, if you like. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, there were so many people linked to the story that it, it, if someone told me that Marilyn Monroe's death was linked to, to you know, UFOs and aliens at, at the time, I would have, you know, rolled my eyes for a while. But the story kept growing. I mean, growing like tribbles on the Enterprise, right? Um, with a cast of characters that you and and here's the thing that leads into the question that is in the chat room. Um, you've classified yourself as one of those characters in a sense as well. I mean, there's no doubt you are a character. We know this, but and that's a compliment. But um, where do you fit into the cast? And then um, the question from the chat room is, are you not worried that you might be a target as well? Um, I, I'm not, and I'll tell you for, for why, really. Um the primary reason would be because if something did happen to me, well, that would just add to the controversy even more, you know. And I think, um, I mean, you know, if it's one of these situations where if I put out something out on my blog or, you know, on Facebook saying I've found this amazing new development in the story and then I wake up the next morning, morning well not wake up the next morning but I, <laughs> <laughs> um somebody finds me the next morning morning with like a bullet in my head you know that would really open the door so i think for the most part um agencies you know um where possible everything pretty much is sort of low key because anything beyond low key really kind of creates a lot of controversy Mm -hmm. um but what i would say you know when you um when you start looking into these things you you do have to be careful i mean there's no doubt about it but you know but the extent to which these things might go is a different thing and it's kind of like with this document itself you know the one i talked about that um you know that looks just like a real cia document And, and in my view you know that's that's what it is um however What's important is the fact that um, the document itself, you know, people say, well, where did this document come from? You know, the, the study of assassination document, the CIA one, that was a legitimate document that came through the Freedom of Information Act. This document talking about Marilyn and Kilgallen and, and um, Cuba and, um, you know, people dying and things like this, um, the the story here is that the document was smuggled out of the CIA 
but in 1992 uh, by an elderly archivist who worked in the CIA and uh, as his retirement got closer, if you like, um, he supposedly sneaked out of the CIA um, and, and took it home with him, basically. And that's not impossible. If you remember um, the situation with Edward uh, Snowden, you know, mm -hmm. um, the amount of material he walked out of the NSA with, you know, a huge amount, gigantic, and he got away with it. And this is just one document. So it's not at all impossible for, you know, an elderly guy back in the early 90s to have sneaked out of the CIA or at least walked out, you know, and, uh, and carefully hid this document. And he supposedly handed it over to a man named Milo Spiriglio. And Milo Spiriglio was someone between the 80s and the 90s. He wrote three books on Marilyn's death, all of them focusing on her death being a sinister death. Now, Milo Spiriglio, um, he, as I said, um, was given um, the, the documents by this CIA, elderly CIA guy, who wanted the story supposedly put into the public domain. Spiriglio didn't know what to do because although he'd written three books on Marilyn, um, you know, this was totally different territory, you know, when you're talking about aliens rather than just CIA agents, you know, it's a totally different thing. Um, but what's intriguing is that um, from there, um, Spiriglio kind of got a little bit... Um, he wasn't sure whether or not really should he go any further, you know. He actually was someone who, despite all the sort of investigative work he'd done, with this one he was feeling, you know, maybe this is too much for me. Um, and he, also, he then handed it over to a UFO researcher named Timothy Cooper, um, who used to live in Bear, Big Bear Lake and did a lot of research into government files on UFOs. And Timothy Cooper uh, then placed this document into the public domain, and it, um, it reached magazines and uh, newsletters and TV shows and things like that. And, and since then, for the next few years, everything kind of just sort of stayed in like a limbo, you know, not many people were doing it, but it was a fascinating story. So that's why, as I said, um, you know, um, 23, 24 I was at the time, something like that. I thought, well, this is a really story, really good story. Nobody's doing much with it. Um, why don't I just go back to the start and, and see where it's going to go now? You know, and, and that's basically what I did. And, uh, and the book itself tells the story, basically, that I've told you and, and your listeners tonight. But also, it adds significant material to, um, you know, to the, the rest of the story that most people have never seen. Like, for example, Milo Spiriglio, um, the guy who the file was handed over to. And, uh, and who wrote three books on Marilyn. I, th I went to the um, centre uh, uh, file, if you like, uh, to the CIA um, to see if there were any files I could find on Milo Spiriglio. And I was amazed when I actually got like a chunky file in the mail, um, which was sort of semi all crunched up because it, it had just about got through the letterbox. And... Um, <laughs> And, and it was filled with a CIA file on Milo Spiriglio, the guy who years earlier had been given the, the document, um, the, you know, this controversial document. Mm. And what it was, the file was amazing really because it was a collection. What it was, it was, um, it was a, a bunch of uh, newspaper articles all photocopied by the CIA, and they were just about copies of just about every uh, newspaper article that Milo Spiriglio had ever been mentioned in. The CIA had photocopied that article and put it into the, the, the uh, Spiriglio file, so to speak. Mm. And um, 
so for years, you know, when people were saying, well, Spiriglio, you know, that document that he's got, it's just a fake, you know, it's garbage, it's just a bit of fantasy. And then you f I find a few years later, you know, when I start doing my investigation, I find out the CIA have got a, a file on him, never mind just kill Gallen or Marilyn, <laughs> you know, there's... Uh, and so, again, the key figures in this story were all the, um, you know, the, the subject of surveillance from various government agencies. And, um, and I also found a couple of um, old-timers as well. Um, um, you know, while I was looking into this, um, and there was a few people who said, well, you know, we heard rumors like this um, back in Hollywood in the early 60s about Marilyn and UFOs, but um, she didn't want to talk about it at the time. Or back then, you know, they called them flying saucers. <laughs> um, and, um, and so, you know, the, those were kind of things that I started to get, like different threads and leads that took me in varying um, different directions. Yeah, and you know what? It, it's funny now to think about it because since most people now don't get all bent out of shape about the mention of UFOs and stuff, um, it was such a monumental topic back then. I mean, and, and bad enough to resort to murder. You know how times change, right? Well, it, it does in one sense. I mean, I mean, if you look at the, you know, the the news the last four or five months, you know, how much UFO coverage there's been, mm -hmm. you know, on TV. I mean, and also, you know, media, newspapers, documentaries, everything. And um, and certainly the last, I would say, last six, seven months, something like that, you know, there's been massive coverage. And more importantly, you know, the media actually taken it very seriously. I mean, there's mm -hmm. always like a slight little bit of sarcasm or whatever, sure. but certainly not... Um, on the size, you know, that it would have been five years, you know, five, ten years ago, you know, the, the journalist would be saying things, you know, what's wrong with you? And, you know, do you have no <laughs> life or whatever, you know, do you know, mm -hmm. got no friends to go out with on a Friday night, you know, that kind of thing. They'd look yeah. down on you as this, like, eccentric ufologist. Today, it's completely different, you know, yes. which is a good thing. Um, but, you know, but, but when you look at it now, we're sort of seeing, you know, strange footage and things like this. Mm -hmm. However, if you think about it, back in 47, when the whole UFO thing kicked off um, with Roswell and other cases and things like that, um, back then, nobody really knew what was going on, even the military. And if yeah. you look back at some of this, the files which have been placed into the public domain now, they make it very clear that, um, you know, government agencies really didn't know what was going on um, and what might happen in the future. And so when you've got, and the, you know, it's one thing to see strange lights in the sky and aircraft, military planes, you know, chasing them, over the deserts in 1948 or 49 or whatever, that's very different yeah. to stumbling on the sort of decaying um, small bodies out in the desert, which have, they had to sort of pick up, you know, grab up quickly and um, mm -hmm. try and preserve them and that kind of thing. And, and then you've got the realization that we're being watched by things from another world and... They're basically, you know, sort of keeping keeping away from us, and uh, we don't know what they're doing. Are they friendly? Are they dangerous? That kind of situation. So, you know, when, if you think about it, if you've got all that suddenly, you know, fell into your lap, you can see why it would become a national security yeah. issue. So uh, you put all that together, you know, and the, the concerns about... Um, you know, people um, speaking out of turn like um, the Kennedys and Marilyn not knowing what to do. So instead, you know, I'll go and tell everybody, you know, what, uh, <laughs> what they've told me. So put all this together in a strange way. You know, you can see how from the, from the start of it to the end, you've got this almost hard-to-believe story, but that does come together um in relation to how um, everything began 
with a Hollywood actress who just by ask, asking questions, can I go to Russia? And then, you know, crossing paths with the Kennedys. And then from there, it all just becomes a national security issue. And then it becomes bleak and dark when people start to die off under extremely bizarre and, um, and um, you know, dangerous situations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's so difficult to even kind of imagine, in a sense, that this is going on behind everybody's back. We don't pay attention, but we also know we get we have stories about that. And you know, it's it's some people will say, "Well, no, that's impossible," and other people will say, "Well, yeah, what do you expect?" So it's kind of a catch twenty two. But so you've probably gone through hundreds or maybe thousands of documents over the years. So how in your mind do you separate the wheat from the chaff, as they say? I mean, and that goes not only for the documents, but for people you've spoken to about. I mean, do, do you have like spidey sense and you can kind of figure it out or, or how? Because there's so many different angles that you're reading about. Well, you know, I, I, I like to think, you know, I, I do sort of a fairly good job of uh, like it's, at, at um, you know investigative journalistic um, tactics, um, and you know you have to be someone who keeps pushing and looking for answers. I mean, it's no good, you know, having sort of you know having a a meek character and knocking on somebody's wall or door, you know, and say, well, you know, I, I spoke to your grandfather or something or whatever and he wouldn't talk to me well you talk to me that kind of thing and if they <laughs> knock on the door well you've got to be you know you've got to keep pushing and um and and i'm pretty good at you know putting threads and leads together mm-hmm. and and like i said you know if you you know you stumble on this old guy living in the middle of nowhere which has happened to me on a couple of times you know and they're like i'm sorry i know i know what you're talking about but i don't want I don't want to talk about it, yeah. and you have you have to get them to talk, mm-hmm. you know, and um, and you have to keep you know perseverance is the thing really, and follow different angles, you know, use the Freedom of Information Act, fight, try and um, track down old timers who may be sitting on a bunch of secrets, um, put all that together, and and sometimes you know I'll write an article um, like on online. And just to see if it might actually catch the eye or the ear of somebody else. And, you know, you might be in the right place, right time, and they read the article and they're like, hang on a minute, I know about that, you know, and um, that kind of situation. Sometimes that will sort of reel people in as well. But um, but really, I, I would take it the same way I would... You know, if I was working on a regular newspaper doing a better a murder case or something, you mm-hmm. know, you would you would take the same approach. You'd interview everybody, get the names, places, and build up the story until you've got like a cohesive, conclusive story, or at least as far as you can get to it. You know. Mm-hmm. So, do you think there is a light at the end of this tunnel on the story, or is it just going to forever be building and you know well, going? Well, one of the things that I do hope is that just the fact of putting the book out there will um, will push people to come forward. And in fact, a, a couple of people have, and not about the UFO stuff, but things about the, the wiretapping of uh, Dorothy Kilgallen. Somebody gave me a bunch of material about that that they knew about back in the, in the 50s. So it's one of these situations where... You know, you, you put the book out, people read it, and somebody, you know, read the book and they say something like, hey, granddad, you know, one of your friends is me- mentioned in this book, you know. <laughs> and then that, that might kind of, you know, that kind of, I'm being sort of, you know, that's not a specific real case, but you know what I mean. It's yeah. kind of like that situation where sometimes you just get lucky because you're in the right place, right time, and you keep pushing and pushing but sitting around and and not pushing, you know, is not going to get you anywhere. You've you've just got to keep doing it and, and don't stop. So. And people don't like it. People knocking on your door. Well, 
I shouldn't have joined the agency, you know. <laughs> That's why I look it, sir. <laughs> Are we still there? Hello? We're, yeah, we're still here. That oh. was weird. Um, maybe we got wired. We got wired tapped, right? <laughs> the men in black. <laughs> yes, that too. Yeah, well, or the women in black. That's all right. Or the women um, in black, yeah. <laughs> but we've got to run. So, Nick, um, thank you for sharing this really thought-provoking book. I mean, we, we didn't really get into the meat of I mean, we did, but we didn't. I mean, you really need to read the book, guys. Um, it's really, really interesting. Um, so where can people find more uh, more about you and your books and everything? Um, well, I have a, a blog called World of Whatever. People can reach me there. Um, you reach me um, at Facebook, and uh, my box are all available um, at Amazon. I've got a, an Amazon uh, book page, and um, I'm always happy to uh, chat with people. And um, you know, if they've got any questions uh, or any, or they had any encounters or experiences and they might want some advice or help again i'm always um happy to to uh, help people so. good well maybe today people will somebody will hear something and get in touch with you and it might be the next step to go anyway you never know that does happen so, yeah. yes i know and that's and fingers crossed all right um i want to thank everybody else for listening in as well and as we're getting out of here until next time everybody Blessed be and merry meet again. Good night. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Please join us again next week at the same time for another great guest and more cauldron stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2024. The Mysterioso March by Kevin McLeod is licensed through Incompetech.com. Thank you.